Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. If you like this podcast, you will love my new anthology called Moms Don't Have Time to Have Kids. Check it out, and you'll hear from 49 authors about all sorts of things moms don't have time to do. All the authors have been on this podcast. Also, check out my TikTok, at with Zibby and Tracy, my other podcast, Sex Talk with Zibby and Tracy. Check out Moms Don't Have Time to Write on Medium. And of course, my new publishing company called Zibby Books. And now back to our daily author interview site and a quick hello from some of my kids. Hi. Hi. Hello. Enjoy the show. Gretchen Carlson is the author of Be Fierce, Stop Harassment, and Take Your Power Back. Gretchen is an internationally recognized advocate for women's rights, whose bold actions against Fox News chairman Roger Ailes helped pave the way for the global hashtag MeToo movement. Named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World, she is the author of the best-selling books Be Fierce and Getting Real. One of America's most successful television journalists, Gretchen has reported our nation's biggest stories for nearly two decades at CBS News and Fox News. Since 2017, she has advocated in Congress for the bipartisan Ending Forced Arbitration of Sexual Harassment Act, co-founded the nonprofit Lift Our Voices to eradicate forced arbitration and NDAs, and returned to television as a special contributor to the new People magazine show, People TV. Carlson also hosts a daily straight-down-the-middle news podcast, Get the News with Gretchen Carlson, on Quake Media. Her many honors include the Sandra Day O'Connor Lifetime Achievement Award, NOW's Women of Power and Influence Award, and the Radio and Television Digital News Association's First Amendment Leadership Award. Carlson is a March of Dimes trustee, a member of Women Moving Millions, and supports underserved women through her Gift of Courage Fund. Welcome, Gretchen. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss your whole life, your books, your everything, this new bill. I mean, there's so much to talk about. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I know, you know, it's really interesting because I've been accused of being a multitasker my whole life. And I'm, yes, I'm, I'm living that, but, I, but I've always been like that. And I'm sure you're the same, Zibby. It's like, and so many moms listening, we're so busy. Yes. And yet somehow we figure out how to get it all done before we drop ourselves into bed at night, before the <laughs> alarm goes off really early in the morning again. And I I just think this is one of the qualities that we should celebrate as women, that we we are so good at this. And I always look at my husband, not to narc on men, but I always look at my husband, I'm like, he can only do pretty much like one thing at a time, (laughs) you know? And, And it's like, I'm doing all this other stuff. So I know everyone listening can relate to that. That is so funny. By the way, I haven't like, aside from when I don't have my kids, I never hear my alarm. I mean, somebody, the dog, the kids, like someone's waking me up. Their alarm would be nice. (laughs) <laughs> well, I know, because I think once we have kids, our own alarm system kind of takes over. And I, I don't know about you, but like I wake up at like the little tiniest pin drop of a sound. Yes, totally. And then I'm up and then I start thinking, you know, and I'm like, oh, gosh, where are they? I have a daughter who just went to college this year. So then Aww. she's home. She's home for a little bit and she makes a lot of noise in the middle of the night. because She doesn't go to bed. So anyway, this is how moms operate. We're always on the go. How old is your other child. So my daughter's 18. My, my son's in that junior year of high school. That's so tough. You haven't gotten there yet, but he's, he's a junior. So he's 16. So I had, they're both driving and moving on up. My gosh, my twins are 14 and a half. So we don't have that long to wait. Oh my gosh. Just, just, just wait. I mean, relish it now because I mean, the driving part is good. You're in the city, so maybe they won't be driving as much, but the driving part is good because it takes a little bit of the onus off of mom and everyone else to be driving kids around, but then you worry about them driving. I worry about everything anyway. I mean, there's so many things to worry about. It would just be moving it from one place to another. I I feel like I'm already at maximum worry. So (laughs) get ready. It gets ready. Oh gosh. All right. Great. (laughs) Thanks for that. Really excited. (laughs) Well, okay. So in Get Real, your first book, your grandfather calls you sparkles, right? (laughs) Which I thought was the cutest thing ever. And it just really speaks to how you shine as a person and how you have gone from, you know, your Swedish family based in Minnesota all the way to being Miss America to Fox and Friends to now this huge advocate for women and so much else and podcaster and everything. Like your life story is so fascinating and inspiring. You must get that all the time, probably. But when you think back just to like go back to your growing up and you paint a portrait of your parents and where they came from and your mom and how strong a woman she was and all of it. And like, how, how do you go from the girl who 
you know, the teacher didn't believe you could read and you have to run home and say like, I can read, I can read. How do you go from that to like overcoming and just like being the person you are? And I don't know, like, what did your parents do right? <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 thank you so much. I would say my life has worked in mysterious ways. And I think so many women can relate to this, whether they're reinventing themselves later on in life or trying to figure out what they want to do with their life when they're you know young. We're always faced with those hurdles. And my life is a great example of reinventing yourselves many times over. And I hope that can be inspiring to other people. I would just say that, that I'm so blessed to have grown up in a small town in Minnesota where the Protestant work ethic was alive and well, which means that you worked incredibly hard. And and at the same time, my mom and my dad would say to me every night when they put me to bed, you know, Gretchen, you can be anything you want to be, but it's going to take a tremendous amount of work. And so I learned that from an early age. I mean, not only to be inspired by parents that believed in me and told me I could be anything, but that the caveat was always, you, you don't have a free ride. Like, like you're going to have to work incredibly hard. And so I, I did that early on. You know, I was a really serious musician and then I burned out with that. So then I reinvented myself, although my mom wanted me to keep playing violin, which is how I got involved in Miss America. But then I was going to be a lawyer and I went off to Stanford University. But then the Miss America thing put me in the direction of television. So then I thought, well, I've always been inquisitive. I guess I'll go and try to be a reporter, knowing that my LSATs were still good for five years in case I <laughs> failed. And, and then that journey just you know, kept putting me into new cities and new promotions and new places. And then when I got to Fox, I mean, never could I have ever envisioned in my life after rising to the top of the television industry, which was my dream, never could I imagine that I would become one of the poster children for sexual harassment in the workplace. I mean, that that's not something you aspire to, Zibby, when, when you're building out your resume. And yet everything I learned as a child, including the courage that it took to come forward, I hearkened back to that. I hearkened back to who I was as a five-year-old and being gutsy. And I determined that if I don't jump off this cliff and finally say something about this, who will? And and so my childhood and my upbringing has a tremendous amount to do with who I ended up becoming all of these years later. And and I hope that people listening will look back on their own childhoods and really dig deep and find those things that you're still living through today. Because I think whether it's adversity or something good, those are our life lessons that I know have continued to propel me into any future goal. Wow. That's amazing. By the way, you should be, why are you not, I know in the book you said, or somewhere you said you, you know, you're an independent in terms of politics, but I feel like you should be a, a, a leader. Like, why are you not in, in politics? I feel like you'd be such well, a great like president or you're so well-spoken you. and like you're, I mean, I, have you thought about it? Just Yeah. Well, thank you for for saying that. You know, I did write in my high school yearbook when I was a senior. Somebody reminded me of this recently that I I wrote someday that maybe I would be Miss America and that I wanted to be president of the United States. But so so never say never. I was asked to run for Senate in the state of Connecticut where I where I live now, but I I was not interested in in aligning with either party. And that's currently my conundrum. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that. We are so divided as a nation and it really, really bothers me. And I think women in general are much more about compromise sometimes than even men are because men look at like the totem pole of power and women look more about coming together in a circle to get things done. And that's how I look at politics. And I guess I would just say that maybe the road that I'm taking now on that journey, who knows where I end up, but that road I'm doing right now and trying to pass my legislation. Yes. So I'm, you know, I'm learning so much about how the political system works. And, and it was so important to me that it was bipartisan. So, you know, who knows where this ends up? If I can get this legislation passed, it, it'll be an insurmountable task. And so never say never. I would just add as the caveat on that is that there's no money in being an independent in politics. And that's why we haven't seen more independents rise to the top because the political parties are so powerful in the amount of money they give to Republicans and Democrats, there's no money for independence. So if anyone's inspired who's listening, we should be rallying for a third party so that we could really get, you know, 43% of Americans identify as independent. And, and we're leaving all those people out in the dust by not having money behind a political party. Wow. That yeah. should be your thing. Your next thing after you pass well, this. I mean, yeah, gosh. Maybe, maybe. Maybe. Okay. Tell listeners about this legislation that you're trying to 
push through how personal it is and all the good news about it lately. Thank you. Yes. So right after my story, when I sued Fox News for harassment five and a half years ago now, I thought I, I thought it was just me. And that's the way the system has led women to believe over the last 30, 40 years, um, kind of on purpose to keep all these issues silent in the workplace. So you feel like you're by yourself. One of the major reasons was that corporations have put these policies in workplace contracts that make sure that it stays secret. And so after I started hearing from thousands of women who reached out to me after my story saying, hey, the same thing happened to me, and I was also shoved into secrecy, I decided I had to do something about it. I had to pay tribute to all of these women who no one has ever heard from ever again. And Zibi, the, the most horrific thing that I learned was that they don't work again. So you know, they think they're doing the right thing. They come forward. They have the courage to do that. They're immediately the, labeled as the pariah and the troublemaker. They're blacklisted, demoted, and fired and pushed out of the company. And then they go to these secret places to adjudicate what happened to them, which is what I'm trying to eliminate, instead of an open jury process. Now they might get some sort of a paltry settlement, but most of the time they don't. And the crux of the whole matter for me was they don't ever work in their chosen profession ever again. And so what I'm trying to find out now is how many women have we pushed out as a result of silencing people? And it's why I founded my nonprofit, Lift Our Voices, about two years ago, to really zone in on these two silencing mechanisms in your workplace contract. And I encourage everyone who works, go look at your contract, because most people don't even know. The first thing is a forced arbitration clause. What does that mean? means you can't go to an open jury if you have a problem. You have to go to this secret chamber called arbitration where nobody ever knows what happened to you. Number two, these expansive non-disclosure agreements. Now, of course, companies should be able to protect their trade secrets. That was the point of NDAs to begin with, but they become so broad that basically when you start on your first day of work, it's like you're, we've been walking in with masks on, but it's basically like you're muzzled from ever being able to tell anything bad that might happen to you. So my bill is very narrow because I want to get both sides on it. And it is eradicating forced arbitration clauses for harassment and assault in the workplace. That's it. I mean, I believe you shouldn't be using them for race discrimination or for gender discrimination or age discrimination or LGBTQ discrimination as well. And I'll get there. But, but first, we're tackling harassment and assault. And the great news, Zibi, is that I've, I've seen this transformation over the last five years, even with members of Congress and becoming much more in tune with this issue and becoming much more open with trying to solve it. So the first time I introduced the bill in the House and the Senate bipartisan at the end of 2017, it never really went anywhere. And then we had the whole Trump situation, which you know didn't help this issue. But exciting news that we reintroduced it in the House and the Senate in July. And now it's gotten out of both the Senate Judiciary Committee and the House Judiciary Committee in bipartisan fashion. This is huge news because bills stay alive by getting through committee. And now it's going to go to the floor of the Senate and the floor of the House. And so I've spent much of the last six months on the phone or in person with members of Congress trying to get them on board. And I'm happy to report that I, I'm almost there to assure that this passes. And I would just tell you that this will be the biggest labor law change in the last 100 years. And it will take women's issues out of the shadows of, of secrecy for, for millions of women out there. And I often, you know, say when, when people introduce me, like, and they say, well, you were this and you were that. I'm like, yeah, but you know what? The most important thing that I will ever do in my life, other than having my children, is passing this legislation. This will be my greatest life achievement. And, and then I'll move on to, to trying to do it for, for more disenfranchised groups but it's just really, really important that this gets done so that we actually tackle this issue by talking about it and taking it out of the shadows. How can everybody, like the regular person at home, how can we help get this through? Yeah. Well, thank you. First of all, women do not call their members of Congress by a margin of 10 to 1. Hmm. Men do. So we have to realize that our voice is important. Every voice counts. And especially in whatever state you live in, when you call your member of Congress, they pay attention because you are their constituent. So please call them or write them and say that you support Senate Bill 2342 and House Bill 4445. Exact same language. They have different numbers in different chambers. 
but say that you support that. We, we also got 65 organizations around the country from domestic violence to harassment to assault to also sign on to the bill. And I got hundreds, even thousands of individual survivors to sign on as well. And, and I'm telling you, that makes a difference because when members of Congress look down and they see, oh my gosh, there's 20 people from Idaho who signed this letter for Gretchen Carlson, they pay attention because those are their voters. So please email your members of Congress or, or call them about a lot of issues, but, but especially about this one. That's so interesting. I've never called a member of Congress. It's like, yeah, it's really easy now. You can email them, but it's really important that men should not be the only voice. And I, one of my favorite quotes in life, it happens to be anonymous, but it is one woman makes a difference, but together we rock the world. And, and that's what I think about every morning when I get up, whether it's trying to pass my legislation or the way in which I raise my kids or, you know, getting my nonprofit off the ground or doing my podcast or going down to work for People TV on television or whatever it is. Yeah, one woman, we all can make a difference. But when we decide we're going to get together and be vocal, that's when we really change the world. So inspiring. I love it. Oh Thank my you. gosh. Well, you're a total role model for just advocating and going out and doing it. I mean, it's it's amazing. We need more people like you to be getting us all together. It's really amazing. Can you share what happened with your are you even allowed now? Like can you I mean you must cuz you filed the lawsuit and everything, but can you share publicly what the sexual harassment incident was that set you off on this whole path? No. No. I mean, that's what, because I am silenced by an incredibly stringent NDA. There have been movies made about my story, Bombshell. There was a a whole Showtime miniseries, The Loudest Voice, made about my story, and I could not participate. I can't even tell you if they were accurate or not. All I can say is that, wow, the the idea that when I was crying my eyes out, filing this lawsuit, not knowing what was going to happen to me in the next minute, hour, day, that the idea that two amazing actresses like Naomi Watts and Nicole Kidman, who are best friends in life, by the way, that they would portray my story. What? You know, I, I, I do have to take the above board approach to it, even though I couldn't participate in just saying that, wow, for that. Number two, that that they even wanted to do movies and miniseries about harassment because before this, nobody gave a damn. Mm-hmm. And then number three, that even if one woman was inspired to come forward as a result of those projects, then, then that makes it worth it. But someday I would like to own my own voice. And that's why I'm working so hard to make sure that future women and my children own their own voices. And, and we've made massive strides in a short period of time. I mean, a lot of women now are saying, I'm not going to sign that NDA anymore. Um, a lot of women are breaking their, their NDAs. And so, no, I can't tell you, you know, I can't tell you my 11 years of hell at Fox, but all I can say, and this is how I have to go in overdrive all the time with my brain, because I have to think three times as hard as anyone else about like, what can I say going up to the line mm-hmm. that will still be in you know, good standing with my NDA? And, and that is that, you know, when, when I finally realized that a career that I had killed myself for after 30 years, that that was going to be taken away from me and it wasn't my choice, that's when I decided to jump off the cliff. And, you know, look, courage, it's not an easy process. It's not like with something like this or anything else that your listeners are going through in their own personal lives. It's not like you suddenly just decide one day to do it. Courage is not like walking into a room and flipping on a light switch and saying, hey, I'm here. It's, it's years in my case, years of building up the courage. And I know people can relate to that about other things they're struggling with in their lives. And I just hope that, and I know I've, I've encouraged so many other people to, to do the same thing. And I think inadvertently I ignited this, this movement and I'm just so proud that other people have found the courage to come forward. But we must stop silencing women. And even though I may never own my own personal story, I want to make sure that that other people own theirs. How did this, how did it affect, this is totally personal, you don't have to answer, but I know you're married to like a, a sports agent and you you had some funny line about like dealing with his big deal career or something like that. How mm-hmm. do you navigate your marriage when there's some sort of sexual thing going on at work. And especially this has become, you know, a mission for you to eradicate this for everybody else, which is amazing. So in the, in the most personal areas, how did you, how do you navigate? Yeah, it's a great question. I would just say that I didn't discuss it a lot at home. Um, My mom was really my sounding board. 
And I pretty much told, well, I didn't tell my mom everything at the beginning because it, what, how women are made to feel is that, that it's your fault. And so I didn't even trust my own self to tell my mom what was going on because I didn't want to be judged, which is what happens to women, even our own moms. Because we just feel, you know, we've been socialized to feel embarrassed about these things, to not admit what they really are, to not speak up about them. Other women have told us not to speak up about them. So I didn't share a lot of it with my husband. I never shared it with my agent. And finally, I started telling my parents and finally I started telling my husband. But yeah, I don't, you know, I don't think it's a good recipe for great, you know, relationship at home to always be discussing what's happening to you at work. That's, that's horrible. I would just also though say that they ended up being my biggest support system. And no matter how old you are, I think you always want your parents to be proud of you and to agree with the decisions that you're making in your adult life. And one of the biggest decision-making points for me in coming forward was, was when my parents finally got on board and agreed that I should sue. You know, growing up in Minnesota, we're, there's that Minnesota nice thing. And so people don't really like think about suing people all the time. And so I think my parents had to get over that hurdle. But I remember distinctively sitting in the mudroom in my house and my parents called me both on the phone together and it was very emotional. We all cried and, and they said, we're with you. And that was at least six months before I actually did it. And then, you know, my husband was just very, very supportive. And then I would just say that in the final moments, I told my children the night before and looked into their eyes and hoped that I was doing the right thing for them and worried so much about how it was going to impact them. But I'll tell you these five years later that my kids have really, really surprised me about how contagious courage is and, and they've got it. And I've seen it play out in my daughter was having some trouble at school with some kids. And six months after my story, she came home and she said, mom, I finally told this one that and I told the other one this. And she said, mommy, I did it because I saw you do it. And, and that just made me break down and realize, wow, she, this courage moved to her. And my son, my son in the same way, after I had done this CNN town hall once talking about these issues, I came home and he was waiting for me and he looked at me and he said, mom, is it true what that other woman on TV said with you that once every 73 seconds that a woman is assaulted or harassed in our country? Mom, is that true? And I said, I'm so sorry to tell you, honey, that that is true. And he looked at me with tears in his eyes and he said, mom, as a young man, I want to do my part to fix that. Again, I hugged him so hard and I thought, you know what? If it's only these two souls <laughs> that I have moved to change, it's been worth it. But I know now that it's so much greater and I still see it playing out in my kids. You know, when when they see my issues come up, whether it's on a debate for president of the United States where they actually asked about NDAs finally and my kids were cheering with me in the kitchen, you know, or they, you know, they say to me, they hear something on TV and they'll look over at me and they'll be like, all right, I know how mom feels about this. And now I know how I feel about this. So they become really educated on it. And I think most importantly for my son, one of the biggest untold stories in all of this is how we need to make sure we get to our sons with this information because they form their opinions about women early on. And we're probably not going to change a bunch of older CEOs out there, although I have hope, but we're really going to change our young boys. And when they become, and women, become the next general counsel and CEOs of companies, we want to arm them with the information of respecting women, because then they will not force women into silence with these clauses. And they'll also pay them fairly and promote them and put them in the boardroom. So I think it's it's one of the greatest lessons that I've learned is that getting to our boys and to our men and inviting them into the conversation is huge. I totally agree. And also, when you said, first of all, it's not true that you've only impacted those two souls, but I, I know what you mean. If every mother did that, that would be everybody. I mean, mm -hmm. what better grassroots marketing is that? I than like know. having everybody tell their own kids. So it's a pretty powerful play in and of itself, right? What we, what we teach our children. So, I mean, that sounds so obvious, but. No, and I've, I've found myself changing the way I parent since my story. I watch the words that I say, you know, we use a lot of words in our society that inadvertently puts women in their place. I mean, we raise our girls to be perfectionists, unfortunately, to color inside the lines. We raise our boys to be risk takers. We gotta, 
we got to try and change, change that part of it. But also, you know, I don't know if it's a Midwestern thing or if everyone does it, but we call everyone guys. Like I'm guilty of that. And my daughter said to me a couple of years ago, mom, why do you always call me a guy? I'm, I'm a girl. And I was like, you know what? You're right. Also, one thing that women do all the time, and I know once I say this, you're going to think about this every time you do it. And that's why I say it, because I hope you do. We apologize and say, I'm sorry, about 50 times a day. When you walk into a door and somebody like is coming towards you, you go, oh, I'm sorry. Even though you have no guilt at all. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who was supposed to go out of the door first, but don't say you're sorry because you're not sorry for anything. You're just coming into a door or you're leaving the door. And I find myself telling my daughter this all the time. She'll say, oh, sorry, mom. I'm like, unless you've done something that you legitimately want to say sorry for, take that back. So as women, we have to stop being, I know we're treated sometimes as a second-class citizen, but we have to stop playing into it and take our power back and be like, I'm not going to say I'm sorry for walking through a door. Catch yourself. If you're listening now, I know you're going to catch yourself today and, and please stop trying, you know, try and get out of the cycle and stop saying, I'm sorry. It's so funny you said that because literally yesterday I was emailing someone on my team about like this manuscript that I hadn't really liked, but other people had liked. And so I started it and I was like, I'm sorry, but, and then literally I stopped and I was like, why am I sorry? I'm, I'm not sorry. This is how I feel about it. So then I went back and I deleted it and I just started, I'm going to pass on this because. And so anyway, I was channeling the you, but I, yes. I, have, I have been trying to catch myself. So it's so funny you say that right now. Yes. And we have to be like, if I ever have my husband, like look over something I've written or vice versa, his emails are so much more to the point. And, and, you know, like I might say, well, I'm really hoping that you'd like to come to this event. No, I'd like you to come to this event. You know, it's just, we, this is the way we've been socialized. And unfortunately, this is the way society looks at us, which is why owning these issues like harassment and assault have been so hard coming because we've been told to push them down deep inside of ourselves and never talk about it ever again. And, and, and therefore, that's why we're sorry for everything, right? We, we have to start being more forthright, get over that bossy hurdle where somebody thinks you're bossy. Screw that. No, we're not being bossy. We're just being like the guy next door that's asking for the same promotion or the same, you know, raise in pay. The more that we all start doing that and get out of the mold, the more that we won't be singled out as being the bossy, aggressive woman. So before we go, just to take this to the totally mundane, you started before we even recorded asking me how my workouts were going. So <laughs> I'm wondering, what is your workout regimen? What do you do? <laughs> well, so I was a chubby kid. And I struggle, I've struggled with my weight my whole life. And I know so many people have, have struggled with that. And, and I still, I still struggle just with food and like I use it as my reward system and, and my body loves to carry weight. I mean, I look, I come from great Swedish stock. My whole family was farmers and the women were all tough and they also had no curves because it was just straight down. <laughs> so, you know, genetically my body likes to be hefty. So, you know, I used to have nightmares when I was in junior high and you had to run that 440 race for the presidential medal or something. I don't know if you guys remember that. I mean, I didn't sleep for like months because I, <laughs> I was so worried. Number one, I wouldn't finish it. And number two, I'd be dead last. And, and so I had to, just like other things in my life, I had to retool my brain to actually start working out. And I will say that I will give credit to the Miss America system because that was one thing that jump started me to really, really, really get into shape. I'll never be that thin ever again, by the way, but it really, and I, I'm not advocating for anyone to be that thin. I'm just saying that it, it did jumpstart me and I became a runner. And so from going to be not sleeping for months to run the 440 to running five, six miles a day was a huge personal accomplishment for me. And it just really made me feel better about myself. My hips started giving out when I turned 40. So I don't run anymore, but I I do believe that working out is a huge stress reliever for me, and I do it mostly for my mind. One thing that I've really gotten into since my story broke, especially for my mind, is Pilates. So I really think it's important for women to stretch so that we don't get that hunched over look as we get older <laughs> and sit up straight, you know, and I'm constantly reminding myself of, of that. But Pilates helps you to strengthen those little tiny muscles that you never even thought about. And then for me, it strengthens my brain because it's just quiet time just for Gretchen for an hour. And I, I get so much power. 
out of that. So it's kind of a dual purpose. And then, yes, I still do my cardio because I really believe that's the only way to sort of try to keep your weight in check if that's something that you're thinking about. And I do it because my favorite hobby is to eat and drink Chardonnay. <laughs> and so I really want to be able to kind of keep that all in, in moderation, but it's mainly for my psyche. And I hope that that's why other people work out is for their psyche. My greatest hobby is to eat, I think as well. <laughs> we'll have to get together and eat. I would love to. And some okay. Chardonnay. That sounds great. Yes. We can compare our favorite brands and yes. <laughs> Just what are you reading now? Last question. Just wondering. Actually, two last questions. I keep going over. I'm sorry. I have so much to ask you. What are you reading now? And then what advice do you have for aspiring authors? Oh my gosh. Okay. Let me start with the inspiring authors. So I just really believe that if you think that you have a story that that you do, okay? So many people come to me and they're like, well, I'm not really sure if anyone will care about this or whatever. It's just start writing it down. And you and I were talking earlier before about how I think it's actually easier sometimes to write a book than to actually market it and and sell it. So just sit down and, and start. One of the things that I found to be really helpful was that I just spoke. I just spoke into recordings and that really helped me to be more like William Faulkner and, and have stream of consciousness thinking. Mm-hmm. And, and oftentimes that just helps me to develop ideas rather than sitting there. I think sometimes when we go in front of our laptop, we're like, well, this has to be perfect. And you have to worry about grammar and all that. No, that's not the way we speak. Mm-hmm. And it's frankly not the way we do TV, which kind of helped me to do this. So speak your story, just speak your story. If you, if you think you have a good idea and start by recording it in that way, it will translate all for you. And, and that's how I got my start both times when I wrote my book. With regard to what I'm reading now, I'm, I'm reading David Rubenstein's The American Experiment. I had a chance to interview him on my podcast. This latest book, he talks about people that really paved the way to mm-hmm. make change in society, which is something that, uh, that I like. And what I did was I, I, I'm focusing on the female stories in his book. So whether it's Billie Jean King, you know, who really paved the way that way, or Madeleine Albright, who was Secretary of State, of course, that's always inspiring to me. So when I look for books now, I, I look for guilty pleasures too, that are just fun. But I also look for, for other inspiration to keep me going on my path too. And how can listeners listen to your podcast and how can they find you and all of that? Yeah, yeah. So I'm on quakemedia.com. It's called Get the News with Gretchen Carlson. It's just straight down the middle headlines, eight to 10 headlines a day. I really felt like the nation needed it because people don't know where to go just to get the truth. And also I'm on People TV. So peopletv.com. My nonprofit is liftourvoices.org. Everyone has a stake in this. So please check that out. And my two books are Getting Real and Be Fierce. Amazing. I am so inspired by you. I'm so glad we talked and I'm going to be rooting for everything and following along and just so excited. Thank you for having me, Zibby. And I, I'm really, I want to do a shout out to, to you too, taking a risk and being brave because you're a great role model for other women by starting your own company and this podcast, which has just blown up. I mean, you just never know. And I always say to women, write down those five things on a post-it note that you've been meaning to do, but you haven't done yet and look at them every day. And one day you're just going to be, you're going to be inspired to do it, whether it's listening to this podcast or to any other or reading a book and finally tackle those things that you've been wanting to do. Because look at what can happen when you do that. You're a shining example of that. My life right now is a shining example of that. And so you can do it. Thank you. Yes. Together. (laughs) <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks, Zibby. Stay in touch. Yeah, yeah. Chardonnay another time. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll have the Chardonnay and, and a good meal. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music.